Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Austin. And I'm Max. And today we're talking about Home Alone. Classic 1990s film. Yes, classic kids movie that we all know and love. Or do we? I do. You'll find out over the course of this commentary track. Spoilers, I do. I thoroughly enjoy this film. Yeah, so um, not really sure why we're doing this movie. I do really appreciate, though, your attempt to try to bring it to some sort of relevance by tying it into the new Saw movie, hypothesizing that Jigsaw is actually Kevin gone crazy. I mean, they say it's a copycat killer, so it's not the original Jigsaw. And Macaulay Culkin's of an appropriate age to play a serial killer at this point. Sure, so, sure. All I'm saying is it makes perfect sense. I haven't seen the movie and I have no intention to. Yeah, and you know but, that Kevin's family would not be like amenable to getting him a therapist to deal with his trauma. So like he's just going to suppress that and who knows how it's going to express itself down the line. And the director of that movie does have a history of taking child stars and putting them in weird fucked up movies later on. Just saying. Right. With, with Repo, we had yeah. Spy Kids Girl. Yes. And now we're having Kevin McAllister being the Jigsaw killer. So it makes perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. And I like to think that once he actually transcends his form as Jigsaw killer, he can actually become the spirit of death from the Final Destination movies. That's his final form, <laughs> Kevin McAllister, when he's fully evolved and transcended the physical realm. Just a pure chaos god. But anyway, back to Home Alone. <laughs> uh, <laughs> really not sure why we're doing this movie right now. Uh, in June. It was I, your pick. It was my pick. You know what, Max? I'm just going to say, if you're a cool person like us, you're going to record your Home Alone commentary track during June and not like everyone else during December. No, not we're even not in like July. Other, yeah, we're not like the other girls, okay? <laughs> we're doing this our own way. Um, we're not doing Christmas in July. We're not doing regular Christmas in December. We're doing this in June because why the fuck not? Yeah, so as far away from December as possible. Um, as for why we chose this particular Christmas movie to do in June. I don't know. Uh, it is a very familiar movie to both of us. And I'm sure that's going to be the case for a lot of people who might listen to this because this is probably one of the most oft uh, revisited uh, Christmas movies for many people. And just childhood movies in general. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that this movie was something I watched a ton as a kid, but revisiting it this week, uh, I found that it has some very like interesting like ideological implications. Um, and like a lot of Christmas movies, it sort of raises questions of like, you know, the distribution of affluence and uh, um, wealth and uh, things you might celebrate during the holidays and then quickly shutters them away when we have to fight away the, uh, <laughs> the uh, lower, um, the low class, uh, blue collar uh, criminals in the wet bandits. And honestly, I found the McAllister family so thoroughly repulsive revisiting it for this week that I kind of found myself rooting for the wet bandits. I got to say, yeah, and I think that's a multifaceted thing of we'll get into this more, but one, you have to remember this is a movie from Kevin's perspective. Yes. So a lot of the stuff about his famous family is cartoonishly over exaggerated. And also, the acting of the wet bandits is phenomenal <laughs> throughout the movie. Oh, I mean, so you can't not on a them. technical level. Almost everything in this movie is perfect. Yes, it's purely in its ideological implications that I think it becomes kind of like weird and upsetting. Um, but we, yeah, like the acting is great. The writing is tight. It's efficient. Right? It's good writing, Max. The jokes are good. Uh, even like the the like ancillary side performances are like perfect. No, it's, everyone does a good job in this. Yeah, it's a very very fun compact and tight movie you totally understand why it was a hit yes and it's it is fun to revisit I'm, I'm glad you picked it it's not what i would have chosen i don't think i would have ever picked this for the podcast but i would say it's definitely worth revisiting even if it does have some flaws yeah I, i'm more keen on it than you are but yeah and uh yeah i think the only thing left to say about it before we jump in is just you know one of the things I'm excited to talk about is, too, how this fits into the mold of, like, that idea of Reaganite cinema that we talked about in our Time Bandits episode, which I would shout out to anyone who's listening to this if you haven't heard that one. Go back and check that one out because it's going to be similar. It's both movies about kids escaping the, the doldrums of adulthood and going into a type of fantasy space that they create for themselves. 
Um, so yeah, I'm excited to chat about this uh, classic movie and invade our, our listeners' homes, much like the Wet Bandits. Yeah. All and I turn got, on their their faucets and leave them running. All I gotta say is keep the change, you filthy animal. Oh, there we go. Twentieth Century Fox. You know what that means, Max. This movie is now owned by Disney. Is Kevin going to show up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe? <laughs> yes. Or is he going to fight a predator? That's the real question. <laughs> Alien versus predator, predator versus, versus Kevin. Kevin. <laughs> we were talking earlier about how fun it would be to have Kevin face off against different horror villains. Yeah. And uh, as fun as it is to like talk about him being Jigsaw, it's like, I would be really curious to see him fight like Jason. Just a, sl- just a slasher villain in general. Just yeah. Like- because Jason is interesting because he's the most he has the most blunt stupidity of any slasher. So it's like Kevin would set up all these traps and like Jason would just like explode through his door. <laughs> and I want to see how he would stop that. But like the nail board would like go into his head and Jason would just <laughs> walk through it. <laughs> yes, he's just like everything about Jason is so stupid that he's like just an immovable object. You can't do anything to stop him. So like. I don't know. I can just envision it in my head. He's like setting up like the the little toys to make Jason trip. And he just like walks through the floor, (laughs) kicking up floorboards and everything. Oh, man. Score by John Williams. Quite a good score, by the way. Does Uh, a lot of heavy lifting in certain parts of the movie. Yeah, more so than you would expect. Uh, Because I think one of the things that I'm going to be returning to throughout this entire film is... Uh, my sense of surprise in revisiting this movie for the first time in however many years, over a decade for sure, um, my sense of surprise of how little of the movie is actually dedicated to the parts that I remember, that being the fun booby traps. Yeah. And I think the music is probably part of that. The movie is uh, a really great example of a, just a type of a classic Christmas movie structure, I think. Um I could totally see this movie in a different universe being made in the 40s. It it has a type of like Frank Capra-esque vibe to it. Yeah. That being said, it's it's sort of existence under the yoke of Reaganite cinema and uh, in a more neoliberal vision of America in 1990 is something that I think seriously harms the charm that comes with that Frank Capra touch. There's a reason why... Um, even though we may doubt the political implications and aspirations of movies like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington or It's a Wonderful Life, they have a lot more charm, for me at least, than something like Home Alone because I actually believe in the ethos that they're trying to ascribe a little bit more. I understand that that means a little bit more for like Frank Capra and he's just such a talented filmmaker. Whereas with this, it's like you see this and you're immediately like, this is just a yuppie family. And I just don't relate to them at all. I understand that it's like I said in the opening, this is from Kevin's perspective. So I believe you can interpret it as like all of their characteristics are completely over exaggerated. We get that in the flashback later on when he's like remembering how they were all treating him. Sure. But, um, at the same time, yeah, like nobody likes, they're they're all unlikable they're all rich out of touch or notoriously cheap or cruel for no reason it's they're inherently unlikable so like when the mom shifts at the like halfway through the movie and it's just like kevin's the most important thing in the world to me it's it's kind of a forced thing that you don't buy at that point well i mean she has a dramatic response to a dramatic situation yeah that makes sense to me I don't think it's I don't think it's like out of place or anything. I just think it's like a type of storytelling that, you know, when I say this is like a classic Hollywood movie, it feels kind of like a classic Hollywood fable. Um, and it it has elements that give it that feeling. And that's again to go back to John Williams and the music. It's why it's so important. The John Williams score has uh, shades of like I, I want to say like melodies and stuff that he would use later on in like Harry Potter to try to convey a sense of magic. And I definitely think some of that happens, especially in moments where it's like, you know, he wishes his family would disappear. It's almost reminiscent of that moment from Krampus when, uh, what's his face? Uh, Max. Yeah. Max throws the letter out the window. Um, and that one, obviously, it's literal magic, where in this one, it's more just like the 
the deft <laughs> implication that there's something magical going on. Not really magical, but, you know, might as well be. It's a contrivance. It's a magical contrivance for the story. And then the other things that are sort of like fable-like in this, in this movie, we already see with the color palette of the house, it's, uh, it doesn't always jump out in every moment, but obviously this is a Christmas house because the color palette is restrained to shades of red and green. Very true. And that's a touch that I would associate with something that's not trying to capture a true sense of like realism and is more going for like trying to tell you like a holiday story, sort of in the tradition of like a Charles Dickens um, Christmas Carol type story, you know? Yeah, no, it it does. It seems like a more earnest uh, than like a Christmas story. I can't tell you like how much it blew my mind at what age when I realized a Christmas story wasn't made like back in the 60s or something like that. And it was just like a failure 80s movie that the rights to were very cheap. So they started airing it 24 hours on uh, cable. And that's why it's considered a Christmas classic. It blew my fucking mind. It's not even the best Christmas movie made by Bob Clark. No. Which, of course, would be Black Christmas. <laughs> Very, very that's true. one of the weirdest thing, yeah. like things within within the course of 10 years he goes from making black christmas to a christmas story black christmas is also one of the most upsetting horror movies ever made it doesn't even have gore in it black christmas is amazing we gotta do black christmas we should but we should do black christmas instead of this let's yeah. switch the podcast <laughs> yeah. um, surprise everyone <laughs> speaking of murdering we have this strange subplot, which is, I don't know. Delivered with a wink. I think the movie, watching it this time, I never really caught as a kid, you know, how much this movie totally uh, communicates to you that they're 100% wrong about this guy before <laughs> it even shows you. Um, it's all in the delivery of Buzz's line where he's like, one of the the cousin or whatever is like, are you sure all that stuff about this guy being a murderer is true? Or, like, are you sure it couldn't just be a rumor? And Buzz is like, no way. <laughs> he killed 25 people. Look at that fucking guy. I also think that he's sort of the Santa stand-in for this movie. Yeah, that is something in Christmas movies where they have a guy who's kind of like... It's like the thing where it's like Zeus arriving dressed as a pauper. Yeah. Except it's Santa. Where he gives Kevin the real lesson. Yeah. Of Jesus, though. Yeah, that is the most shoehorned bit in the movie. <laughs> well, I don't think it's shoehorned. I think it works. I just think it leaves a bad taste in your mouth because it's like, oh, this movie is kind of conservative, isn't it? Yeah. And well, it makes it's sense. almost like it had to remember to be a Christmas movie where it was like, because up until then, it was kind of just like a fun, whimsical romp. And they're like, oh, fuck, we need to put a message about the holiday in here. Well, yeah, we have to have him learn. Well, like, what's the thing that's going to sell this character arc for Kevin where he becomes, like, a real bourgeois? Jesus. That's what'll do it. And they're not wrong. That is what would do it, isn't it? Kevin, in this early part of the movie, is essentially recognizing and reacting to, acting out against what he would notice as, like, certain contradictions in, like, this bourgeois family structure. Uh, and... Uh, the reconciliation of those things at the end requires like a purely ideological example, which I think we've talked about this in the past. Like one of the clearest examples in film of like ideolo ideology at play in like storytelling and plot logic is just like, look at any Christmas movie because so many Christmas stories are about, I mean, go again, going back to the probably archetypal original example of all of them in a Christmas Carol, uh, so many of these stories are about like people's access to money or resources or affluence, right? And then the idea of like celebrating the things you have um, and your associations and your family um, and the relationships you have like throughout your life, right? Yeah. So the thing is though, when it when it tries to tackle something that's like talking about like the idea of giving and receiving gifts and stuff like that it's like okay so you're gonna bring up stuff that directly responds and relates to like a material existence right so whenever you, they try to be moralizing hey, it's 
<laughs> Keenan Culkin, Macaulay Culkin's brother, <laughs> are playing Fuller. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Um, he's also well known for... Piss in the bed, apparently. Yeah, that. But also he's uh plays Wallace in Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Oh, it's that guy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's like, I think like eight different Culkin brothers. They're, it's a it's a big family. <laughs> That's too many. I know, That's right? Too many brothers. I can also tell you one of the siblings. I think the woman that plays the woman, the girl that plays Megan McAllister in this, went on to be a two time Olympian in judo. Really? Oh, I love this line from the uncle. Look what you did, you big cunt. <laughs> Look what you did, you stupid bitch. <laughs> he might as well have said that. I know. <laughs> Seriously, if I had a kid and my uh, sibling said that to them in front of everyone, I'd like punch them. Exactly. Like, what the fuck is wrong with you? Um, but yeah, to go back to the diatribe I was going You're on. such a disease. Jesus Christ. <laughs> they really burn him. They, ta- they say... To- You're just such a piece of shit. We fucking hate you, Kevin. You should kill yourself. They basically say that to him. Um, but to go back to my diatribe about Christmas movies, I think the ultimate example is something like uh, the the Grinch who stole Christmas, right? So it's a movie that's going to be about like material uh, deprivation, where the the Grinch. It's kind of like this movie. The Grinch is stealing all their shit, right? And yet they still come together to hold hands and through the power of ideology, like transcend this like material lack that they're experiencing. But again. Embracing that type of ideology is an inherently conservative thing when it's trying to celebrate this like edifice of this like yuppie bourgeois family. And you see them come together at the end. And it's like, there's no saving this corrupted evil family. Everyone in this family is terrible. It's, <sighs> I understand that it's supposed to be a fable and it is. And they're supposed to it yet again. I don't want to overuse this phrase, but some of this is wish fulfillment. And the fact that they are a wealthy, well-to-do family kind of plays into that where even at the base, it's already just like, oh, look, you have this big house and lots of things to do. And it provides the means for him to create his elaborate traps and maze-like labyrinthian house later. It's true, but it's it's too much so, Max. It's They're too wealthy. They're too yuppie. Um, they're not a normal family. They're a wealthy family. That's what makes them a target for Joe Pesci. Yes. Even more so, there's other, you know, signifiers of their, like, you know, class status. The way that Joe Pesci can so easily step into their house as a police officer and use that against them. It almost seems like the movie at certain points is, like, making a comment on it. But then it goes back into, at the end, retreating into that ideological, uh, I don't know, retreat is what it is. It's basically saying we've we've raised certain contradictions about like this way of life. Also, can I say that he was like, I don't want to go up there. It's the, scary. Look yeah, at this awesome. fucking place. Awesome. This is every kid's dream. Yeah, to have live in a glorified attic. Jesus. Come on, Kevin. He does have the Annabelle doll there on the right, though. <laughs> so that's not cool. The actual Annabelle doll, not the <laughs> horror movie doll they have in the movie. Yeah. I'd love for like to watch people go to that museum just like, oh, we get to see the real Annabelle doll and they just see a fucking raggedy Ann doll in a glass case. You don't even know if it's the real one. True. They, that was a fucking mass produced doll. This is the sequence where I'm talking about it having some sort of, you know, fable like mystical aesthetic. John Williams does a lot of work here because it's like, speaking <laughs> of Final <laughs> Destination, Max, yeah. it almost feels like the forces of Christmas are contriving this scenario where Kevin gets his wish temporarily. A little Christmas magic for you, Kevin. Or Annabelle magic. Yeah, so it was the Raggedy Ann doll that did all of yeah. that. Again, stuff like that is just like, the the jokes are well written in this. The idea of these these guys driving them to the airport, you have the aftermath of the previous joke where they ran over the statue, right? The jokes in this movie are really tight. It, it, and on, on a structure level, everything is really tight. By the way, we haven't talked about either of the parent actors. Um, both great. Yes. Both, both great actors. We like Catherine O'Hara, and we like John Hurd. Now, Max, have you ever seen the movie Cutter's Way? I have not. Okay. John Hurd in that movie delivers, like, an all-time performance. Absolutely amazing performance. 
Cutter's Way is an amazing movie as well, but uh, it's got Jeff Bridges in it as well. Um, but John Hurd in that is basically like a paranoid asshole Vietnam vet who's like also crippled from Vietnam. And uh, the movie is just him sort of drinking and, and uh, arguing his way into trying to uncover a conspiracy. <laughs> um, but his performance in that is like legitimately one of the best performances I've ever seen. How does, kind of, how does his performance in this movie stack up? It's quite different. It's quite different. Could this be a sequel to that movie? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Uh, in fact, it's quite strange to even see him in this role. You know, a mere, what, like five or six years later, I think. Uh, and it's kind of sad that he, I don't think he really ever got many opportunities to build off that type of performance that he gave in Cutter's Way. He seemed to become more this type of character actor where he was playing like dads and stuff. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it's like, like, I don't know what other roles he might've done in his career that even stack up to Cutter's way or even gave him the opportunity to. So I don't know. Do you think it occurred? I don't know. That's nitpicky. What? She, she was directly looking at him while he goes, okay, bye. Bring me back something French. Well, the point is that no one yeah. cares. Yeah. I think Catherine O'Hara in this also, I mean, obviously she has a very important performance and she probably has the most challenging performance because she has to also sell the idea that this like family is salvageable. All of that rides on her shoulders. And part of that too is selling the way in which they forget Kevin. And uh, she makes it very... um, I don't know, very recognizable as a certain type of person who's like late for their flight on a vacation, you know, and I'm sure many people can relate to this. However, when you really stop to think about it, it's like this would be the worst family ever, wouldn't it? Yeah, but this is also the quintessential pre-9-11 thing where it's just like, okay, we're at the flight now. We can leave. Yes. Bye, everyone. Take what's ever, whatever's free. Just go fucking yeah. hang out in there. That would also be another interesting twist on this movie. Is like, what if they get on this plane and it is 9-11? <laughs> Kevin's family never I comes home. I made my family disappear. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I guess it wouldn't be a Christmas movie, but maybe you could write around that. <laughs> Enter like a time vortex. <laughs> <laughs> oh man Kevin cost 9-11 come on Macaulay Culkin answer for your crimes <laughs> the pizza underground isn't the only crime you've committed <laughs> against humanity <laughs> Dick Cheney gathering intel on the 8 year old home alone that's a crime against humanity that Dick Cheney is still alive Who's going to kill Dick Cheney? Nobody. Who's going to step up? His heart's not going to do it. Someone has got to. Yeah, because they keep giving him new ones. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yes, here we have the original uh, Miracle on 34th Street, I believe. Which is actually a real movie that they play on the TV. Yeah, quite a good movie, too. Yes. I believe the first film for uh, Natalie Wood. Great actor. Now, Max, you mentioned that this movie was wish fulfillment. Let's talk more about that. When you say that, what do you mean? I mean that as a kid, you have this idea of what being home alone by yourself would Mm, be like. Yes, exactly. This is exactly what I want to talk about. Where you don't have any nagging parents. You can eat whatever you want. You can get whatever you want. You can watch whatever you want. You can play with whatever you want. And everything ends up fine. Like we see him sled down the stairs, out the door into the snowbank. Works fine. Perfectly. Stops right in the snowbank. He's doing doing great. Suddenly, injuries no longer exist because we have that Looney Tunes logic. Yes. Yeah. Where you can eat whatever you want. You don't get sick. Yes. Nothing, nothing bad happens. Yeah, whatsoever. you become Shaggy and Bugs Bunny. Yes. Yes. And... 
even if there are scary things, you you learn how to conquer them by yourself. Or you just don't deal with it. Yeah. It's it's the perfect wish fulfillment. And that's why I think kids watch and rewatch this movie, not just for the fun traps and goofy jokes, but like to justify their belief that like they are as good as adults. They know better than adults in a lot of ways. And they can <laughs> take care of themselves even if they will eventually miss their family they're fully capable of doing everything by themselves yeah i think that is i think what we're talking about here is the engine of the movie i think you're right that is a, probably the key part of why this movie became a classic it's not just that it has this fun like twist on the home invasion uh premise but also like what does it mean for this to be a home invasion when there is a kid home alone and that's why you know when you revisit it now and it's like oh wow I really never noticed how little of the movie was him setting up the traps. It's like, that's because the fantasy that is set up of being home alone is something he enters into in these first like five minutes. Yeah. You know? And as a kid, when you watch it, you're like, Oh, the adventure begins now. The adventure begins the moment he wakes up and no one's there to tell him what to do. And it's kind of, I don't know the way they do it too. And the way they introduce him being home alone, I think is like, maybe unintentional, but like kind of ingenious too, because it's like, it's the exact thing that is like most annoying about like starting your day as a kid when you're woken up by your parents yeah. early to do something. And I think something kids can all relate to immediately. And I think that's why the family needs to be at least slightly well off is because like, if he's poor and home alone, then it's just like, Oh, this is sad now, but and he's used to being home alone. Yeah. Yes. His parents are always working. But he the, has to be sheltered. But the, yeah, this, it's like, yep, never home alone. You have 80,000 siblings that are always looking after you anyway. Oh my God, I made my family disappear. This is, seems like the most out of place thing in the movie. Honestly. Oh, the talking heads? The finally. sitcom talking head <laughs> things. It's just... I'm going to feed you to my tarantula. It's very cheap. I don't know. I think it works to communicate it. <laughs> the fucking uncle. Like what you did, you stupid shit. <laughs> oh, Kevin. And you can see, we're not going to talk too much about Macaulay Culkin, even though he gives an excellent child actor performance in this movie. It is corny at bits, but like, he has to sell this movie because if he's annoying, then the movie doesn't work. Yes. And... He's just so much fun. <laughs> Not his first movie. No. Uh, he did a smaller part in the other John Hughes film, Cool Runnings. Everyone's favorite movie. Uh, was this before or after was he was killed Jamaican by bees? The Jamaican bobsled one. What? What movie was he killed by bees in? What the hell? Uh, I'll, John I'll, Hughes? No, Macaulay Culkin. Oh, Jesus Christ. I don't know. The Wicker Man. No. Now I need to find this out. He was killed by bees as a child? Yes. Okay, here's a little fun fact about Buzz's girlfriend that Kevin just responded to. He holds up Buzz's girlfriend and gives Oh, my girl. 1991, that was right after this movie. He died? Yeah. This is a killer bees movie? <laughs> he was allergic to bees. <laughs> Got stung by them and died. What the fuck? What yeah. is this movie about? Is it about him dying? Or is that yes. just something that happens incidentally? I believe so. Okay. So what is it, like a drama about like a mom who fucked up because bees got close to their kid? What is happening with this? Well, either way, Max, uh, the thing I wanted to talk about with uh, Buzz's girlfriend that I think oh, it, okay. I actually found kind of charming was that uh, that picture is not actually of a girl that is the director, Chris Columbus, dressed up as a teenage girl. Oh, okay. Because he felt uncomfortable having an actual girl be the butt of that joke. So he was like, we're not going to make fun of someone's appearance. So it'll, it'll just be me. Yeah. Oh, but we're, we're watching now angels with filthy souls, the movie we should be doing instead of this movie, except we can't cause it's not a real film. Yes. Although I assume it is based on the classic gangster film, angels with dirty faces. Could be, well, but I, I would assume so. Max. No, I, I assume it's just, a coincidence that they have nearly identical names. I will say that the dialogue in this old gangster film, there's a reason why this dialogue is famous because it works so perfectly. 
And I can't imagine how many people were totally convinced this was a real movie and spent years looking for this. I know I only recently learned that it's Yeah, it was like the last real. couple of years. Yeah. I know there is like a 15-minute version of this that they released somewhere. Oh, really? Yeah, just like all of the all right, scenes. right, Johnny, from- I'm going. Oh, man, I love that. This is also the first thing that is uh, going to be a pattern in this movie, Max, uh, where we'll notice throughout the rest of the, this movie, starting with this moment, there's many instances where Kevin will perform an idea of like criminal behavior or criminality. And that's the first, that's the origin point. It begins with that movie, Angels with 30 Souls, right? Uh, and in some ways, that's what Kevin is kind of like grappling with as a character arc. He's, he's this cherubic young boy. And it's like, oh, what's this question? Will he mature or will he remain? Will he have a dirty soul still? That sounds also very disturbing, disturbing, given like the very church atmosphere vibe of this. That sounds something like a Catholic priest would say to a boy to get them alone. They wouldn't notice when they were all sitting down or you were just happy to be in a first class away from your fucking children. Now, Max, let me ask you something about Catherine O'Hara. Yes. In this exchange here. Who do you think is the breadwinner for this family? Uh, he is. Why? Because she always mentions his job and his work, and I don't think she mentions working once during the entire film. Are you giving off? Why? I disagree. Because she's the more proactive one. One, Two, I noticed that when they pay the pizza guy, she's the one with the money. He doesn't handle the money, and he seems kind of aloof. And three... We see all these mannequins around the house, and I think there's hints that she's like some sort of designer or something. They have like fabrics and like sewing shit in their room. And for Max, she is just dressed like a woman that to me looks like she works like in an office building. Like she has very like kind of like stark and simple clothes that feel like work clothes to me. And I know that's something with the 80s, too, like the, you know, shoulder pads and, you know, shark yeah. angular outfits for women. But I just think that's something that I'm, like, responding to. But the movie doesn't really say anything about it either, so I don't know. The only real, like, outfit accentuation that she seems to have are kind of, like, dangly earrings. So I don't know, Max. I, I get the impression that she might actually be the breadwinner, and I think it... It might speak again to this movie's sort of conservative undertones where it's like, you know, the man is kind of the man of the house. That's something that Kevin will say repeatedly through this movie. And it's yes. kind of like part of his arc is his testing his mettle in, in like an inauguration into masculinity against these two criminals. Right. And it's like him building this relationship with his mom. And it's kind of like. I don't want to veer off the edge into (laughs) Freudian psychoanalysis too deeply here, but it has kind of like an Oedipal conflict underpinning it where it's like, yes, he's going to defend the house and he's going to rebuild the relationship with his mom primarily. Yes. The rest of them are superfluous as long as him and his mom make up. I mean, that's that's the real emotional core of the movie. Yeah. So I don't know. Nobody cares if he makes up with Buzz. (laughs) Yes. Uh, The movie cares if he makes up with Buzz more than it does his dad. He has no interaction with his dad at all. At all. Yeah. (laughs) Which I find interesting. And I don't know, maybe it is something where it's like, you know, throughout the 80s, Max, I think you see a lot of the depictions of masculinity in the 80s are kind of, in some ways, a response not only to like Reaganism and the rise of neoliberalism in America, but also like a, a response to second wave feminism and women's liberation throughout the seventies. And, uh, I don't know, maybe movies like this with their sort of kind of nostalgic atmosphere and, uh, embracing of Reaganite ideology. Maybe you could say that it's an extended version of that. albeit one that's like less malicious than other movies when, when women are like put into their place. Um, or at least it feels more wholesome on the surface. Yeah. I mean, 
but it's like the idea that like men there's a younger generation that is going to restore buzz. The, the man of the house buzz is the epitome of the alpha male <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes he is oh they even have creepy silhouettes like villains yep like cartoon characters Probably the first cartoon aesthetic moment. One thing I really appreciate about this movie too is how deftly um, Chris Columbus is able to return to every single part of the house that is later going to be set up for traps, which is very important. You know, he doesn't have to give us a 100% clear idea of the geography of the house, but he does have to show us different areas that are going to, you know, be repeated throughout the movie. It's kind of like writing a symphony almost. It's yeah. like you have to start with a theme and then you build variations on it. I mean, you get a pretty good idea of the areas that matter, which are like the first floor, like dining room, living room, the and specific the kitchen. doors yeah. that they need to, yep. The basement, the stairs that they're going to go up and down. Yeah, the stairs and the upstairs hallway. Yeah. Like all the important areas are shown numerous times and you get a good idea of where everything is in relation to which, which is good. And it does that without like being annoying about it. But also I think the thing about it that is sort of enjoyable to revisit and watch is not only how like economically it builds those moments, but also like if we're talking about that, um, that idea of like when the parents are gone, the house becomes a type of fantasy space. It is necessary to have it be a variation of what came, became, like came previously. And this is where we'll relate it to something we've talked about a lot uh, as like the ultimate classic Hollywood story structure of the Wizard of Oz, where you start where there's a world of desire. Then in order to uh, have the characters pursue and attain the thing they are desiring and lacking in the first part of the movie, they kind of enter a world of fantasy that is either a literal world of fantasy in the case of the Wizard of Oz or something that is simply like a plot contrivance, like in this movie. The plot contrivance is family forgets him. It's not exactly plausible, but it's the premise of the movie. So he has thus entered a world of fantasy where he's acting out these uh, fantasies uh, of being home alone and how much fun it would be uh, and then fighting off criminals all by himself, right? So that's what happens in these movies. You enter, you leave the world of the desire into the world of fantasy, and then at the end of the movie, you return to the status quo, except the status quo has been reinforced by the character's experience in the world of fantasy. And of, of course, world, Wizard of Oz is the ultimate example of this because it so specifically ties the world of desire into the world of fantasy with the repeated characters. Everything in the world of desire is sublimated into the world of fantasy. So um, in this movie, you have the things that Kevin is lacking uh, in the first part of the movie that are then sublimated uh, into the second part, I which would, is often the locations around the house. I would like to sidetrack into this movie's all cops are bastards moment where the cops don't do they do less than nothing. They actively like make things worse almost by they one, they just give this lady the run around and then they send somebody over. The guy knocks on the door once waits two seconds is like, eh, those kids, those people are insane. They tell them to count their kids again, which is like the most, I mean, it probably is what would happen, but yeah, these are Chicago police. <laughs> He's too busy eating a brat. You think the... I can't do my Chicago accent. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what that accent even He's was. too busy doing, eating a brat. Eating a brat. <laughs> you just sound like an old woman that smokes too much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, isn't that what all people in Chicago yeah. become? <laughs> an old woman that smokes too much. You live in Chicago. Beat you're it, sm bozo. <laughs> you're smoking a lot if you live in Chicago. Let's be real. Chicago's a great city. What am I saying? Except for Mayor Lori Lightfoot. You can go to hell, you stupid piece of shit. <laughs> I don't know. She's awful. <laughs> Open up. But Max, it's not entirely the police's fault. You know who else's fault it is? Catherine O'Hara. You know why? Because she doesn't say, hey... My kid's home alone because I forgot them. She says, 
he's home alone. Can you check on him? A little bit different there. I think you need to accept some responsibility here and just tell the police that he's not supposed to be home alone and you forgot him on your way to France. But no, we can't do that. Because that would have her admit that, I mean, she already did, but that would have to. But the, the thing, the problem with this movie and its ending too is like, the sin is too great to be reconciled by what the movie shows us. You know, like if you really think about it, like Kevin would need, even if his house didn't get like assaulted by bandits, like he would need a lot of therapy to probably get over like his family just treating him like that, you know? And it's not like they suddenly, everything suddenly fixed and that they care now. I mean, come on. Always had a huge crush on this French girl, I gotta say. I've been pretty hard on the French on this show. Historically, yes. This one girl, pretty good. If we have any uh, French uh, women listeners who work at, you know, an airport. <laughs> That's one Austin's one thing. Send me an email at Austin he at never, Spectator Phone Podcast. He never shuts up about it. Yeah. That's his one, his one thing. Yeah. Uh, that is actually actress Hope Davis. You tell me she's not French. Uh, Don't do this to me. No. Uh, she's Her most famous role is in uh, Captain America Civil War. Well, it's over now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for ruining it. Playing uh, Tony Stark's mom, Maria Great. Stark. So there you go. That's what you get for being attracted to people, Austin. They yep. end up in Disney movies. But you know what? At least they got that that Disney paycheck. <laughs> Another interesting thing I noticed about this movie this time around is how it kind of uh, works as like child training. Like you could just put this on for your kids and they're going to learn about certain things to do and not do. Like don't climb on shelves. Because then the tarantula will get will will get loose. But that saves him later on in the movie, right? But <laughs> also, doing research for this movie, I discovered one: there's a Home Alone wiki because there's a has to be a wiki for everything, right? Okay. A- and uh, the tr- the tarantula has its own page on the Home Alone wiki. It does not have a name. It's just named tarantula. Um, but it does have an allies and enemies <laughs> section in its character bio, okay, which good. I found hilarious. And its allies are Kevin, Buzz, and the McAllister family. And its enemies are the Wet Bandits. So it's good to know the Tarantula actually does have a grudge against them. And it's not just being weaponized against them. It right. truly does hate them. There is more about that Tarantula that I'll say later when it comes into play. But it is, it is a storied thing. Was it seen with Jeffrey Epstein? Uh, no, actually. It was the one person in this movie that was not seen with Jeffrey Epstein was this tarantula. Macaulay Culkin was seen with Jeffrey Epstein? Yeah, but not in the same way. (gasps) I can't believe you just said that. (laughs) Oh, my God. We've gone dark. We've gone dark. What do you think we're talking about? (laughs) We bring up Jeffrey Epstein. (laughs) His questionable financial practices. (laughs) (laughs) So the other thing that's probably worth bringing up, we talked about how, you know, Kevin will see these repeated images of uh, criminals that he will uh, engage in and perform different versions of, including becoming an actual criminal where he uh, by accident steals a uh, toothbrush approved by like the National Dentist Association or whatever the fuck. Um, In this scene, he becomes an actual criminal. But uh, the other thing to note out is actually how similar the Wet Bandits are to Kevin. What they were doing in that other house is in some ways vaguely similar to what Kevin's doing. Uh, And uh, they're basically kind of acting out the fantasy of being children (laughs) in some ways. They're walking around making a mess, but then Joe Pesci is just kind of enjoying himself with the kaleidoscope. It's, It's something that I can see a child doing on Christmas Day when they when they've, you know, opened their presents before they should. And, uh, you know, they feel like they're getting away with something. Of course, all of that changes when 
they want to kill Kevin. Yes. But uh but then we get serial killer Santa Claus to save Kevin at the end. Yes. Although we never know what why? happened to his hand. Yes, and why did he come here when he's still actively bleeding? Yeah, why did he slam his hand on the the glass and, and then why did he give him the glare of death? Oh, he's buying band-aids actually. I never noticed that. I do think it's hilarious that he didn't bother to talk to Kevin until after he disturbed the shit out of him by maintaining eye contact and not blinking. Jimmy, beat the shit out of that kid. <laughs> <laughs> He's like six years old. Let him have a toothbrush. Oh, man. If anything, called child services. Well, we know what would happen now. <laughs> This cop is pulling out his gun. Right yeah, away. just instantly starts blowing people away. <laughs> yeah. Keep the toothbrush, you filthy animal. In fact, I'm glad I'm glad you took. No, it. but Kevin's white, so he'd be fine. I don't know if Kevin was black, then he'd be dead at this point in the movie. Unfortunately, he's wearing, we're going real dark at this point in Home Alone. Jesus, that's what I'm saying. You watch Home Alone, and now you watch it as an adult, and you're like. This gives me dark feelings. It should be giving me feelings of whimsy and joy, but I just know how it's going to end. I know Kevin won't be emancipated from this disgusting family that he's in. And I know that he will grow up to be like Pete Buttigieg's campaign manager. All I know... I mean, he does meet Trump in the second one. <gasps> That's right! That's right, Max. Although Macaulay Culkin has said that he wants a version of this movie where that scene is edited out because it serves no purpose. Eh, that's incorrect to do. We're not George Lucas here. I'm sorry, Macaulay Culkin, but I think it deserves I mean, to be spoken for exactly how beholden to the forces of capital uh, filmmakers are. Like, uh, let's not hide from the fact that, like, this is gross commercial exploitation or whatever. Well, listen, Twitter did a really sloppy edit of Hatsune, uh, Hatsune Miku replacing Donald Trump in that scene. And what? I, I think that is just who, as effective. Who is that? Hatsune Miku is a holographic pop star in Japan. Oh, are they like uh, one of those hololive, like, yeah. VTubers? Uh, imagine a VTuber, but, like, a real-life hologram. Performing. Like Tupac at Coachella. Yes. That was like 15 years ago now. Yeah. Um, but like that, except it's an anime girl. So somebody inserted her into Home Alone too, instead of Donald Trump. So that that's also capitalism and disgustingness. But at the same time, it's just Hatsune Miku. So I think we should do that. Jesus. You know what, though, Max? They're giving this kid a lesson. And at so far, they're totally okay. Yeah, honestly. And frankly, they're looking out for Kevin more than his fucking family did. They're like, kid, don't walk in front of cars. What the hell are you doing? They didn't. Yeah, they didn't curse at him. They didn't, like, insult him. They're just like, you have to watch out for traffic, man. That's why I'm on the team of the Wet Bandits. Because they're just totally reasonable. They're robbing these yuppies that are totally insured for everything they own. Uh, and uh, these yuppies will have no problem recovering from all the shit they steal from them. And uh, what are they doing with it? Nothing. They're just having fun looking through kaleidoscopes. It wasn't until this like Avenger of the bourgeois, Kevin, uh, comes <laughs> along and thwarts all their plans that they started getting violent. And frankly, it was justified. This is basically the same thing as, like, Battleship Potemkin, is what I'm saying. Although I do think it's funny how uh, they're like, why is he running while they pursue him in a giant van? Directly pursue him, not even, like, a block behind or anything. Yeah. <laughs> why are you running? <laughs> why are you running? I love that video so much. That's <laughs> got to be one of my favorite videos on the internet. What is that from? Is that a that a Captain whatever movie? The movie that was made in Uganda on a budget of like negative. Oh, who $10? killed Captain Alex? I think that might be from. No, there. have you seen that movie? Uh, my roommate will not shut up about it. He I loved, I've told you about this. Yeah, it was made with like 
they had to make their own cameras and computers and okay. editing stuff. It was it's ridiculous. That movie, okay. It's inspirational that it got made but, at all. Yes, that's the thing about that movie. People are introduced to that movie because they like good, bad movies, and they're like, wow, this is terrible. But the more you learn about how it was made, it's like, this is actually the most inspirational fucking thing I've ever seen. And also, you watch it, and you're like, everyone from this guy's like community in town is like in this movie, and it seems like... It seems like they restored a social function to filmmaking where it's like this feels like like a town coming together to perform like like a true community bonding thing. It's honestly like a very beautiful movie. <laughs> it's very amazing, but it would be impossible to do a commentary for it because they have the VJ. Yes. In it, which uh, if you don't know what we're talking about, we're talking about the video jockey. The guy who talks over the movie <laughs> while right. it's playing. Everybody in Uganda knows Kung Fu. <laughs> yes. I like the parts where he's like, the panther and the tiger. Or the parts where he's just screaming movie over it. Movie! He just says that a lot. That movie's so good. That movie is honestly one of the best movies of the last, like, ten years. Not even kidding. Now, Max, here we have this really fun scene, which is the beginning of the shenanigans yes. with Kevin, where he's doing the performance. And this, I would say the movie is not, maybe not saying this because of how it ends, but I think you could very easily turn this scene into a moment where it's like a commentary on the image of the bourgeois family, which is, it is so plastic and unreal that it can be simulated by a bunch of mannequins. And that's what t- keeps the, the bandits away. It's the simulation of the family. Did they not finish Angels with Filthy <laughs> Souls? They're not watching that. Oh, are they not? They're okay. in France. I know, but I think it's the same thing, just in French. No, it's not. Oh, okay. It's That was Jimmy Stewart. Oh, was it? Okay. Yeah. I just looked up and it was a black and white movie. Now, Max, I'm going to use this opportunity to read a quote. From a book by Robin Wood called Hollywood from Vietnam to Reagan and Beyond. And it's a quote that I've sort of revisiting from Time Band. It's about Reaganite cinema. And if you want a clear idea of what Reaganite cinema is, I recommend you listen to that episode. But Robin Wood identifies several different principles that he uses to define uh, Reaganite cinema. And uh, the first one that he chooses is childishness, which I think coincides with this movie beautifully. So I'm just going to read this. He writes, I cannot abandon this theme without somewhat fuller development. It is important to stress that I'm not positing some diabolical Hollywood capitalist Reaganite conspiracy to impose mindlessness and mystification on a potentially revolutionary populace, nor does there seem much point in blaming the filmmakers for what they are doing. The critics are another matter. The success of the films is only comprehensible when one assumes a widespread desire for aggression to infantilism, a populace who wants to be constructed as mock children. Critical here, no doubt, is the urge to evade responsibility, responsibility for actions, decisions, thought, responsibility for changing things. Children do not have to be responsible. There are older people to look out for them. That is one reason why these films must be intellectually undemanding. It is not exactly that one doesn't have to think to enjoy Star Wars, but rather that thought is strictly limited to the most superficial narrative channels. What will happen? How will they get out of this? The films are obviously very skillful in their handling of narrative, their resourceful, ceaseless interweaving of actions and enigmas, their knowing deployment of the most familiar narrative patterns. Don't worry, Uncle George or Uncle Stephen will take you by the hand and lead you through Wonderland. Some dangers will appear along the way, but never fear. He'll also see you safely home. Home being essentially those quote-unquote good old values that Sylvester Stallone told us Rocky was designed to reinstate. Racism, sexism, quote-unquote democratic capitalism, the capitalist myths of freedom and choice and equality of opportunity, the individual hero whose achievements somehow make everything all right, even for the millions who never make it to individual heroism. So that's one of the many different passages where he's talking about, you know, what makes this Reaganite cinema. But I think that that retreat to childishness, like we've been talking about, is one of the core facets of this movie. And this movie really nails it because it truly captures that again, again, that idea of being home alone and what it would be like if you were a kid, at least in your dreams. Yes. And within that framework, it even provides you with 
uh, even more fantasies to play with where you get to like, again, if we're identifying with Kevin here, reinstate our like childhood subjectivity against the worlds of, of the adults, not only by uh, refuting our parents, but by refuting these criminals who are coming to assault your house as well. Was that his revenge on the pizza guy for not bringing another cheese pizza? For him I or? suppose so. But I, I think that scene is where the movie really begins to hit its stride. Um, and I kind of regret t- sharing that quote over it, but it's still a great scene. I think the thing I love about that scene, Max, is that that's the first time he really performs his like criminal behavior to really get something. And in a different version of this movie, you could actually see him becoming like the prodigy wet bandit <laughs> um, uh, acolyte because he steals the toothbrush by accident, right? And he clearly feels terrible about it when he's walking home. You know, it has that long shot with the very um, shallow depth of field to isolate him from everything. And he's just walking slowly and he seems very dejected and sad. Um, He didn't mean to steal the toothbrush and he feels bad about it. But then he scares the shit out of this pizza guy to avoid paying him a tip. And he's having the fucking time of his life. And he's doing so using the, uh, you know, keep the change, you filthy animal moment. Famously. Oh, please. You don't miss him. You don't miss these fucks. You can't even remember what your dad looks like. That's how often you see him. Yeah, you know who else Kevin McAllister would grow up to be based on his uh, precocious behaviors and his activities while he's, uh, you know, getting ready in the morning? What? Patrick Bateman. Hmm. A little bit of an American psycho in this yes. scene right here. <laughs> he's only a few ways. Uh, have you away. heard of Huey Lewis in the news? <laughs> <laughs> I only use a specific type of skin cream because it doesn't have alcohol. Alcohol dries out your skin. I learned that when I was home alone. My mother left me home alone. I love, like, that's the most iconic face in the movie. Like, it's on the cover. Oh, when he's screaming? Yeah. But that's just, like, I, I never got that joke as a kid. And yeah, it, I never understood it either. I was like, why is he hurting himself? And I'm just like, oh, he's just pretending to be his dad putting on fucking aftershave. Right. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> like, At least he's really committing to that joke. He's done it twice. <laughs> you know what I really love about this camera shot, Max? When it, the camera's dollying around to the uh, checkout stall is how they bothered to have the camera at his height <laughs> as yeah. it's coming around. It really adds to it. Also, this woman is like, again, one of the only people to actually give a shit about Kevin in any capacity. Yeah, but at this point, he's he's moved on from having getting too nervous to even buy a toothbrush from the corner store to being able to buy a week's worth of groceries. Yeah. But again, it's, if we're looking about, um, if we're looking at like what really defines his character arc in relating it to like the, the tropes of the Christmas movie genre, it's all related to like consumerism and buying things, you know, like, Oh, is this what marks him as an, as, an adult, his ability to buy things without getting so nervous that he accidentally steals them. Yeah. He's too manipulative, Max. He must be destroyed. He would become Jigsaw. Would you like to play a game? Or Pinhead. Kevin would become the new Pinhead because he gets addicted to manipulating people. <laughs> and he's like, I must search for ever more extreme experiences. Okay, Max, has this ever happened to you where your shit fell through the bags? Yes. Yeah. Not as comedic timing <laughs> where they both happen at the same time. But. Yeah. I don't think you've lived until you've done that, listeners. Go to college in a town where you have to walk like a mile to get like groceries. Because you're a freshman and you can't have a car. And then <laughs> have it break on you. <laughs> oh, 
What do you think about the inclusion of the evil furnace? It's it's interesting. Um, I never really got it as a kid. I kind of appreciate it more as an adult, where it's just like those weird nonsensical fears you have as a child that like <laughs> don't necessarily make any sense, but like you still have them. <laughs> it's just a thing. I don't really know if it's nonsensical fear. I mean, kids are scared of like weird things in the dark, you know, like that makes sense to me. I think it's interesting that it's included anyway, where it's like, okay, so we have these positive fantasies of being home alone, but they also bother to include a negative one. It's like, I hate having to go down into the basement by myself when I'm home alone because I'm scared. And that's something that I can do more easily if my family's home. And of course, they tie it to the act of doing laundry, which is something that all kids hate to do, and they associate with adulthood and, uh, you know, having to. What an idiot criminal, by the way. And again, talking about the really economical writing, so good, so good that Kevin once again uses this this movie to fucking scare the shit out of Daniel Stern. And for me, this is the start of the really uh, ingenious slapstick performance that honestly, if I had to choose one perform, like it's not just one performance. It's both Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern, but really them. But Daniel Stern, if I had to choose one, Daniel Stern gives the better slapstick performance, I would say, <sighs> just because he has better facial reactions, I think. And he he takes more punishment than Joe Pesci <laughs> yes. does. Yeah. I think it's just because, yeah, his face is much. Look at him. Is more expressive. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. But it's like really their slapstick performance is what carries the second half of the movie. And I think it's the ultimate reason why the movie's, movie's successful. It's not just, you know, um, it's not just the strong performance on Macaulay Culkin's part where it's like, okay, he's he, in his strong performance. He's fulfilling this fantasy of us setting up these traps. It's like, oh, when you see this slapstick stuff, it's like, oh, they're working. It's like, the reason it's a fantasy is because it's successful. It's because yeah. when Kevin does it, it actually works, you know? In real life, if you stepped on plastic toys, it would just fucking hurt, but you wouldn't slip and <laughs> break your neck or something. <laughs> Snakes. Snakes. The guy got blown away. <laughs> Let's get he out of here. like a snake. <laughs> Max, what would your uh, criminal name be? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the manatee. <laughs> the manatee. Just, you know, kind of chubby and slightly useless. Protected by the government. <laughs> exactly. Like Whitey Bulger. It's not the first time I've thought about how you and Whitey Bulger are similar. <laughs> Oh, really? What was the first time? So this actor is from Child's Play. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this guy. Which I can't believe I remember that. Yeah, he was the he was the mall manager in Child's Play, which like I'm like, no, it's not the same guy at all. It's like, you know what? I think it is the same guy. You know what it is, Max? It's not just his appearance, which I'm sure was, you know, filmmakers were like, yeah, can we make you look like as much of a human pig as possible? Um, but also it's like in both movies, he's haranguing a mother, which is interesting. Uh, but soon she's going to be saved by John Candy and his polka band, the Kenosha kickers or whatever. Haven't you heard of them? They had a big single a couple of years back. Yeah. Polka, polka, polka. You know, apparently there's like 18 hours of footage of them like riffing. Like they shot an ungodly amount of like it's footage like, of Catherine O'Hara and John Candy. And then that's just what made it into the movie. It's like, I don't know if you needed like 20 hours to do that. It's like the legendary, like just hours and hours of a uh, Robin Williams scat for Aladdin. Or you never had a friend like me. <laughs> or I'm thinking of like Stanley Kubrick, like having 10 hours of footage of like Scatman Carruthers, like standing up and sitting down from the shining. <laughs> and then Scatman Carruthers just being like, I don't understand what you want me to do differently about this. <laughs> Gus Polinsky, Polka King of the Midwest. Polka, Polka, Polka. 
Kenosha Kickers. I was right. That is what they're called. Mm -hmm. Now, Max, you know what's special about Kenosha, Wisconsin? Nothing. No, there is there is one special thing about it. Do you know what it is? I do not. It is the birthplace of one Orson Welles. Isn't that interesting? Good for him. It was good for him. It was back when Chicago was a boom town. That's the only reason he became Orson Welles is because he was close enough to Chicago. Oh, the French. They do go to France in this movie. They do go to France. And they have some of that French champagne that is known for its excellence. <laughs> what if uh, Kevin had to fight off Orson Welles? <laughs> He'd lose. Orson Welles trying to break into his house to eat some food. Hey, listen, I've seen Citizen Kane. Orson Welles can fuck up a room. <laughs> he can. He can. Yeah, Kevin would lose. He could beat Jason. He could beat Pinhead. Yeah, he, he would. He would get destroyed by Orson Welles. Orson Welles would go like, if, especially if he's like channeling Charles Foster Kane. He'd be like, "I'm obsessed with childhood, and I'm going to become a kid again and, and, and Kevin, ride my yeah, sled." Kevin has a sled. We've yeah, seen he's it. Like, I'm going to take your sled, Kevin. You can't stop me. You don't know what you've signed up for. You're back at the U-Haul with, with a bunch of polka players. What, what is the way that could be worse? If they were part of a ska band? Yeah. That would be more annoying, wouldn't it? Well, if there was a ska band, there would somehow be more of them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there would be more of them. There'd be like five people who just play like tambourine. 18 trumpet players. <laughs> yeah. That's like the, the, the question of plaguing modern day music is like, are there more band members in Slipknot or in any ska band? I, I'm pretty sure the mighty, mighty boss tones have like twice the members oh of Slipknot. God. <laughs> Did you see their George Floyd song that went viral? No. A few weeks ago. <laughs> Nor do I want to. <laughs> It's one of the worst things I've ever heard in my life. It's like, I can't believe if we, if we just need to end everything. <laughs> Humanity was a mistake. One of my favorite comedians was talking about the mighty, mighty boss toads and how they're just <laughs> fucking worst where they're like number one sing single is the fucking about like nothing bad has ever happened to me in my life, but I know somebody who something bad did happen to and it kind of sucked. So I don't know if I want anything bad to ever happen to me. That's the entire point of the impression that I get. What the fuck? Ska is just, uh, get your, get your trumpets out of my punk. Don't, don't contaminate it that way. Learn a different dance besides skanking and do, do something else with your life. Now, Max, I want to ask you a little question here. What time of year was this filmed? Uh, summer. Are you sure? Yeah, that's why there's snow everywhere. But some shots, they have the green of the trees, and you're like, okay, obviously this is out of season. Yeah. But then other shots, they don't have leaves. This was filmed in the greater Chicago area because... As is the case with many of John Hughes's movies, they were such big hits throughout the 80s that he basically could set up his own production company outside of Chicago. And I think he lived in Chicago. That's why so many of his movies take place in like, you know, suburban Illinois towns. Oh, God. Do you have any interest in doing a John Hughes movie on the show? Why not? I'm. Are you. Do you enjoy his movies, though? Oh my God, I also had a huge crush on this elf girl. I think I did too as a kid. Because oh. she has that like very hot, but like annoyed, like young person working a shit job thing. Yes. And she's nice to him. And she's got the shoes. That smile. Um. <laughs> but then you find out she has a boyfriend in 10 seconds. Is it the Santa? No. Okay. This guy hosts a podcast, though. <laughs> or he's a serial killer. I swear to God, Max, you were so close to being a mall Santa. I feel like I could totally see you being a mall Santa. That's like the most insulting thing I've ever heard. Are you kidding me? Why? Why? 
I don't know. I just think I could see you being roped into being a mall Santa. I'm sad now. I'm just going to be quiet <laughs> for the rest of this. That's mean. Why did you say that? I just could see it. I can see you being a mall Santa. I'm not that fat. It has nothing to do with that. I just think it's like a certain, I don't know, a certain je ne sais quoi. I can see you being like a, a mall Santa. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed the last episode of the Spectator Film <laughs> Podcast. You can find all our past episodes on spectatorfilmpodcast.com. Yeah, see, the elf took the last of her candy cans home to her boyfriend. That's some good characterization for that boyfriend. <laughs> Now, do we buy that Kevin was really going to ask Santa for his family back? He seems a little bit too precocious for that. Do you think Kevin believes in Santa? At this yes, point? he says he does. Okay. He says that he knows that's not the real Santa, but he knows that he works for him. Right. And he is the youngest in his family. So if anybody in the family still believes in Santa, it would be him. Here we get the biggest plot hole of the movie. I guess it's not a plot hole. When you really consider the sort of like Oedipal like structure that's guiding what Kevin's arc in this movie, it's not okay for him to simply go to someone else's house, even though it makes all the sense in the world. He could just be like, hey, some people are invading my home. Can you help me? No, we can't do that. I'm the man of the house. I have to protect it. Yeah, I don't, my memories of Home Alone 2 are very hazy, but <laughs> is it ever even implied that he told his family <laughs> what happened with the wet I bandit? don't know. I don't know. All we know at the end of this movie is that Buzz's room is destroyed. And he's going to beat the shit out of him. And so. he's going to quote unquote pound him. Interesting. Uh, I hate you so much. <laughs> And it's now Jesus. Now we're at the point of Jesus. The part in every Christmas movie as a kid where like my brain would just turn off. Yeah, I straight up did not remember this at all. Yeah. In this, in this, like, I didn't remember any of this. I think I've brought this up before, but I was, uh, I was raised Unitarian, which is a sect of Christianity, which is essentially the religious equivalent of a shoulder shrug. Um, where you learn about most different kinds of religions when you're young. And as you come of age, you kind of make your own decision about it. Um, which gave me a very interesting, <laughs> uh, relationship to like all these traditional Christian values movies. Cause like I never, we didn't have mass in that traditional manner. We just sort of had a bearded guy talk to us about different things every week. Um, but like it, we never, it was never this spiritual for me. So it was always like so alien and weird to me when I would see this in movies. It's because you Unitarians are bandwagoners. It's <laughs> if you had to press me, I don't think it's necessarily a real religion. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I was brought up in it because it teaches you critical thinking <laughs> skills from a young age. But like calling it a religion is a little <laughs> bit of a stretch. Oh my God, he finally talks. But that I was just, I brought that up because like all of this, like it's supposed to be like a universal experience around Christmas time. And it's just, it's not always so alien to me. Yeah. I don't think this movie makes that assumption about its audience though. I think it assumes that its audience would take for granted that this is the place where Kevin would find his redemption. Now this is quite similar to how this podcast was started, was it not? I yes. walked up to you in, a, in, in an empty church and said, Merry Christmas. Is this seat taken? <laughs> yes. And I started telling you about my non-existent granddaughter. <laughs> Which is weird because there was uh, nobody, <laughs> nobody else there in the church. I was just cleaning up as my job as a janitor. Well, that was right after my job as a mall Santa. <laughs> oh, Jesus fucking Christ. Well, you were a church Santa. <laughs> 
right before my job as a dumpster diver. Just oh yeah, from uh, from uh, what's that movie? Shrek. Wish upon <laughs> you and Ryan Philippi dumpster diving. Did we ever do Wish Upon on the show? Or are we just no, gonna... we, we prepared to do it, but then we decide not to. Or are we just going to reference it for all of time and never do it? You know what? It's a good, bad movie, but I don't know how much there is to talk about. Because yeah. it's, frankly, it's a it's a teenager movie, but it's like so half-heartedly a teenager movie. <laughs> it's a teenager movie written by people in their 60s. Literally. Yes. I think it's written by a man named Joseph Sargent, who like... Oh, I don't know. I don't remember that. Or did Joseph Sargent write the fucking Spider-Man, Sam Raimi Spider-Man movies? I don't know. My brain is going right now. I can feel my brain dying. I'm transforming into this old man with Alzheimer's as we speak. You're going to become a mall Santa. Honestly, there are worse things than being a mall Santa. I think your reaction to that statement speaks poorly of your view of mall Santas. Maybe you're right. Whom I revere. <laughs> we know what was funny though, revisiting this this week was uh, seeing exactly how much this fucking weird ass man is willing to divulge to this eight year old <laughs> to solve his emotional issues. You'd be surprised. As a, as somebody who's worked at a convenience store. Old people will literally tell their entire life stories to anybody who talks to them for two seconds. I I have had numerous old people spill their entire life stories. But you're to not me. eight. You're not eight. Yeah, but also old people have nobody to talk to. So I think this, this guy, guy too. Yeah. At least I don't have to worry about it because I'll be dead by then. Like, I am so much banking on being dead well before I reach this man's age. <laughs> not only can I not afford it, but I don't want to be around for that. Can you imagine being so old and having no one to talk to and then talking to a young boy on Christmas? Fucking kill myself. <laughs> This is going on for too long. Yeah. And now it's making me uncomfortable. Why is this old man talking to a young boy? Get them away. Got nailed. I feel like dinosaur pajamas are more acceptable. Dinosaurs than... are the shit. Yeah. I was obsessed with dinosaurs when I was a kid. Same. Did I ever tell you about how uh, I actually own dinosaur bones? Yes. How easy it is to get them online? Yes. As long as you're not Nicolas Cage. Yes. And apparently it's your undoing. <laughs> Don't buy millions of dollars worth of dinosaur <laughs> skulls. Oh, if we're talking about, uh, by the way, weird fun facts about this movie. Not really about this movie, but I don't know if I've ever mentioned this on the show about how my dad once dated Catherine O'Hara. I feel like you must have brought that up at one point. Yep. They went out. She dumped him. Good for Catherine O'Hara. <laughs> I mean, honestly. <laughs> yes. This is a good move. Max, we're almost at the best part of the movie. I know, right? He's going to say a prayer to his macaroni and cheese real quick. and then. Oh, my God. Don't even get me started on the fucking macaroni and cheese. I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but I love macaroni and cheese. Who doesn't, right? <laughs> People who are lactose intolerant, I assume, probably don't love it. They probably love it even though they can't eat it. That's, that's, that's the real true. Torture. That's also true. Um, to you people out there, I'm very sorry. However... Uh, I want to say that uh, something that really triggered me as a kid was seeing him prepare this lovely macaroni and cheese meal with the candles and everything. And then he doesn't even eat it. It was like that was the worst thing that the Wet Bandits did to him is that they deprived him of his ability to sit down and enjoy a fucking Christmas meal. Craft mac and cheese. 
You know, this movie do- is somewhat similar to Predator, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking of Kevin. Kill me. I'm right here. Do it. Do it now. <laughs> he cast like a child Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, that's the thing. They there, look like there is that movie, uh, Playing Dangerous, where like apparently it was edited to shit. Where like, oh, the best of the worst movie. Yes, where they tried to like make an action movie version of this, where it was like. Die Hard meets Home Alone. And there is like a part of me that wants to see like an actual good version of that, of just like the kid action hero type thing where he has to survive and make actually effective booby traps like that. Well, Max, I'll recommend it to you once again. The movie that uh, famously they sued this movie. Yes. Uh, Dial Code Santa Claus. Uh, Not really like this movie at all. I honestly don't understand what they were thinking when they sued them, even if the Chris Columbus, when he made this movie, directly ripped off Dial Code Santa Claus. It is so thoroughly different as to be just like completely separate entity. There's really no creative or legal uh, claim to be made about like it being a direct copy. Um, but either way, Max, I think that movie... I think it's way more in line with like the traditional expectations of like a horror home invasion movie. Uh, however, it is a little bit more of him like fighting back in a more like direct, like child soldier way. But that's also a movie that I think is more directly like tapping into an idea of consumerism too. And once again, we're talking about in that movie, uh, it's a little bit more surreal than in this one. Um, they take a lot more liberties with like the set and like production design, but he's also a rich kid. Yes. Um, but more like fantastic and, and fantastically and like luxuriously. So in that movie, what if he mixed up the BB gun for just like an actual shotgun, Santa Claus and his elf, then I guess, uh, <laughs> <laughs> just blew their <laughs> job. He's losing his, losing his scrotum in less than five seconds. Honestly, for an eight-year-old, it's pretty, like, insightful that he even knew to shoot him in, like, the nuts. Eh, that's something you figure out on the playground in elementary school. I don't know. Seriously, Marv could not be more stupid. If I was there, I would be shitting myself so hard because I'd just be like, I don't know that this is a BB gun. I'd be like, this kid has a rifle in my face. (laughs) I'd like piss myself immediately. This is America. Yeah. You could legally be carrying depending on what state. Oh, it's Chicago. But still. So I don't know. Oh, man. I just love the litany of things that would, like, kill any normal human. Well, that's why it's Looney Tunes-esque. Yeah. This is a movie that would make Chuck Jones smile. Yes. Maybe. And interestingly enough, not the first connection between Chuck Jones, perhaps, and Chris Columbus, because as we know, Chuck Chris Columbus wrote the first Gremlins movie, and Chuck Jones actually has a cameo in that, I believe. It also makes Buster Keaton smile, I feel like. Uh, yeah, there's a little bit of Buster Keaton in this. I think Buster Keaton would admire the uh, slapstick premise in some of these. Yeah. None of them are quite as acrobatic. Oh, no, of course not. It's Buster Keaton, but I Buster do... Buster Keaton was an insane person. Like, the best kind of insane person that I'm so glad exists, but like... Yeah. God, we gotta do some more of his movies. I'm so glad we preserved... That's a Buster Keaton fall. Yeah. That one from Joe Pesci. That was something that Buster Keaton was always great at was doing the type of fall where somehow he like does a complete flip backwards and his ass is up in the air. And you're like, how did that happen? (laughs) 
Sorry, we're, we both stopped talking just because we're so... Completely engrossed waiting for Daniel Stern to fuck himself up somehow. Exactly. This part is entrancing. He's entering this house of horrors. This is really, I mean... This is, this is what people remember when they think of Home Alone. They don't think of the church scene. They don't think of the, is this toothbrush approved by the American Dental Association scene. No, they don't think of that. They, they, they think, think of, of this. It. Yes. And for good reason. It's all, it's all fun and games until somebody gets a nail through their foot. Okay, what do you think is the worst thing to happen? Because obviously a lot of it is very cartoony and unrelatable in terms of the pain, but then some of it happens and you're like, oh my God. The nail through the foot is pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. And this, like, why the fuck you would keep trying to go up the stairs as opposed to like the fucking <laughs> through the bushes. <laughs> Just walk up the bushes. Is beyond me. Where are you, you little creep? Oh, man. It's just so perfect how much of a Bugs Bunny Kevin becomes. I can't remember. I, I never really watched the second one, but I can't remember any of the shit from the second one. Like any of the hijinks that he does. Yeah. I remember none of it. Also, I'd like Tim Curry as a secondary antagonist really? as well. Yeah. Oh, man. The only thing I remember from that one is like the pigeon lady. Yeah, no, Tim Curry was like the head, like butler or whatever at the concierge at the <gasps> hotel. Oh, the nail. Yeah. God. <laughs> I love the way Joe Pesci walks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I think this one coming up might be my favorite. They just take a flamethrower to Joe Pesci's head. If I'm ever acting in a movie, I hope I get the opportunity to do something like this. The classic, would you light your hair on fire for my movie? <laughs> well, I mean, it's pretty good. They can, he's got the, you know, the bandit like uh, beanie on to hide his identity and they can just put some like gel or something on that. What would this movie be like if John Waters had directed it? If John Waters had directed it? Yeah. I don't know. Well, who would Divine be in this? Would Divine be the character that's home alone or would Divine be the one that's like sending her minions to invade? No. Because Divine is, act Divine is uh, active. She's an invader. She is. But Divine is always like, even if she's not a the good person, she's always like the focus of the movie she's in because she can't not be. She's the center of gravity. Yeah. Yeah. Everything orbits around her. Is it worth it at this point, guys? Like well, now they're doing it for revenge. I know, but there's like, it's like you're making so much noise. <laughs> you're screaming, you're breaking shit. I mean, that's the thing too, is like, you don't know he hasn't called the police. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, I mean, we, people might ding us, Max. We might get dinged for saying, for knocking the like implausibility of everything yeah, that's, that's happening. Yeah, that's true. It is it is a cartoon movie. Yeah. And at this point it's so well executed that you just buy it. No, know. I know. And we enjoy the premise and the conceit. But that being said, Max, the logical, you know, inconsistencies, they do reveal something about like again the ideological implications of all this which is like the movie is becoming about like just beating back these, you know, criminals who are characterized as poor blue collar workers literally hiding out in a plumbing truck. That's how they're scoping out this bourgeois rich neighborhood. Oh, I'm going to say that these, uh, these might be the worst for me, honestly. Well, that's very relatable. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the, the stepping on the ornaments, it's a very relatable type of pain. Yeah. But that's sugar glass, like clearly sugar glass. Sure. But you can still, yeah, you know what it is? It's the audio. When you hear yes. it happen and you hear him screaming, you're the like, sound oh. sound mixing in this part is especially good. <laughs> yes. It's quite good. Especially when Joe Pesci burns his hand on the door. You can hear yes. it. Yes, 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 yes. The solid thunks of the paint cans as they get hit in the yeah. head. Yeah. We really are missing something when you can't hear. It. Yeah. Because I think it really sells a lot of it, you know? 
<laughs> Look out, Joe Pesci. Oh, poor Daniel Stern. Now, Max, I don't know if this is going to make sense, but I think naming him Marv was the funniest thing they could have done. I don't know why, but it's so good that his name is Marv. Yes. I have to check out Archive, archive of Our Own after this to see how many Wet Bandits pairing there is. Oh, you know there is. Yeah. I'm more scared of, you know, the Wet Bandits and Kevin. <laughs> That's what I'm scared of. Or Kevin and Fuller. Pissing the bed. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> I, feel like a- oh, I feel like AO3 has to have some rules. I don't know. My name is Murphy. <laughs> so why was he doing that? I don't understand. So he, he's going to go across the street. Yeah, his plan yeah. is to lure them across the street, and then the cops are going to show up there. Why? I don't know. I don't know. I don't understand either, honestly. I, all I noticed while watching it was like, okay, so that I guess that's another way. In, I thought I was missing something. Oh, but I, so I, I, I had said before I was going to bring up some facts about this tarantula. Okay, yeah, do that now. Um, <laughs> so there's a lot of rumors about this scene. That, uh, that Daniel Stern being very scared. Yes, well, Daniel Stern was fucking terrified of this. But there's a rumor that he doesn't actually scream there; that he just opened his mouth and pretended to, and they, they overdubbed didn't it later. Startled. The uh, according to Daniel Stern, that is completely false. Uh, he did scream at the top of his lungs when he did that. That was entirely real. Um, he also asked the animal handlers if they had uh, like removed its poison sacs or whatever, like it could be declawed like a cat. And they had to explain to him, uh, "No, that's not how that works. If we if we did that, the spider would be dead." And he'd be like, okay, but if you put it on my face, then I'm going to die. Do you see the problem here? I don't know if that's a poisonous tarantula. No, it's not. And okay. I don't think there are any tarantulas. Did they tell him it was poisonous? Yes, I think they did. <laughs> I can just hear Chris Columbus being like, yeah, tell him it's poisonous. It'll really help his performance. I know he's scared shitless anyway, but tell him it's poisonous. He did say that afterwards, uh, hitting Joe Pesci with... Uh, <laughs> Tiger Iron was scarier than working with it. Well, you know why? Because Joe Pesci works method. Yeah. So you know if Joe Pesci decides that it's in the character's like, you know, impetus to like fucking smack you back with the crowbar, he's gonna do it for real. <laughs> also, there's some weird stuff about that too with Joe Pesci doing method shit, where apparently when he was like nibbling on Macaulay Culkin's fingers, he actually did that for real. Yeah. Like he bit down on his fucking fingers. It's like, this kid's nine years old, Joe. What are you doing? Which, I don't know if we've talked about this so much, but every time you hear stories about some asshole actor doing something like like that with, like, method acting, that is not what method acting is. All actors who do that have, like, a complete misunderstanding of what method acting means. (laughs) That's not what method acting entails. It's that's just actors being assholes. Well, yeah. And then being like, no, I'm method act. No, you're not. That's not what that is. What actor said that recently? What? Where it was just like, you know, I like, I don't believe in method acting because whenever it's method acting, um, it's them being assholes. You never see somebody like method acting being like super nice. Yes. Because method acting and being super nice. That's an effective way of method acting. The stories about people being assholes. They just, are assholes and then they excuse it by saying it's some part of me- like a magical acting method which they ascribe to method acting it's like no that's not how that works that's literally not what would be taught as method acting so oh man guys just give up the only thing that doesn't happen to them is a piano getting dropped in their head also, if they wanted to rob the house, they should have just, like, as soon as you went to the tree house. Just... Well, they, he was like, I'm going to call the cops. Now, Max, here's the real question, okay? Yes. Do you think you... No. Could out... Okay. <laughs> could outrun Macaulay Culkin? No, no. Could outsmart Joe Pesci and Daniel Stern uh, as the criminals? Probably. But not that smart. Well, I think the much smarter thing to do would be to just 
if you're in Kevin's shoes, you're nine years old, just call the police before. Have them hide around the corner. Yeah, but then he doesn't get to do all this fun stuff. Right. I mean... He had already planned it all. He yeah. drew that cute little map and everything of the house. <laughs> yes. He had this entire... The battle plan. Yeah. Sorry, it always cracks me up, all their fucking battle scars. <laughs> yeah. They look like zombies. Now, this is also a plot hole. How did this old man know they were there? Uh, he's apparently shoveling the sidewalk 24-7 when he's not <laughs> at church. So, Like a fucking weirdo. Come on, let's get you home. I just fucking murdered these people. Oh man. This this old man's backstory is like don't breathe. <laughs> There's so many horror movies that this movie ties into. It's amazing. He's got a giant vat of semen in his basement. The single pube at the bottom of it. <laughs> With the turkey baster. Oh my god. That movie went from being I'm inter- here to kidnap my granddaughter. <sighs> that movie went from being like interesting to just fucking being garbage. exploitation <laughs> <laughs> didn't they make a sequel to it i think you're thinking of uh they did didn't they no i, think... I know they were they were making one the movie was a huge hit yeah well, surprisingly yeah you wouldn't think that like a weird ass exploitation girl trapped in the basement movie would be a huge hit i think i think you might be thinking of a quiet place because that came out no around the same time no 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 they, I, they definitely made a sequel. Yeah, it just Don't came breathe. out. Also, a Quiet Place took came out a solid two years after Don't Breathe. No, it was like right same around the same time. No, Don't Breathe came out in 2016. Quiet Place came out in 2018. So this will be this week's example of I say something about movies that is true, and then Max is like, I don't think so. And then Max looks it up, and then Max says, oh, you're right. That could be true. Are you ready for it? It's going to happen. Get ready, everyone. Do do. All right. When when did it come out, Max? Uh, you're right. I Fuck am you. right. Yeah, I know. It feels good to be this great. <laughs> well, I was gonna say sometimes it gets old being the king, but someone's got to do it. Someone's got to be right about all the movies. Oh, and Don't Breathe Two is apparently coming out this year. Oh wow. Okay. Starring Macaulay Culkin, if only. No, Bobby Schofield. What do you think of this scene? This weirdly depressing scene where, like, John Candy's like, hey, we never see our families. It's kind of odd that the scene comes after Kevin has already like the climactic moment where Kevin has beaten the criminals. I understand that you don't want to like from an editing standpoint, you don't want to break up that, that momentum that you've built. Right. And the movie carries it so well from when he has that revelation at the church. And then he's like, this is my house. I must protect it. You know? So I don't know where you would sit you know, sort of like fit this scene in, but like it, it does feel awkward after the movie kind of feels over. I won't say that this movie has like return of the King syndrome, but like Kevin's one, you know, like there's no more drama. Yeah. This scene kind of like editing wise, that scene feels like it should have been a earlier. Couple, yeah. A yeah. couple minutes before him. But I also don't know where you would put it. Because I also wouldn't interrupt. I don't want to cut away from Kevin fighting off these criminals. You don't interrupt that. In some ways, that scene feels like Chris Columbus felt bad about shooting like 20 hours of improv between them and not using any of it. So he's like, okay, well, we got to use one scene yeah. of it. We well, already played John Candy all this fucking money to be in our movie. We might as well get. He's some... got to be in it for more than two minutes. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to tell a weird ass story about traumatizing his kid and leaving him at a funeral home. 
they actually just stuck both of those actors bit in the back of a U. <laughs> all, and that was all of the improv. Just real stories between two of them. You think John Candy actually did that? Yes. Okay. I'm 100% convinced. Okay, cool. <laughs> Get the fuck away from me. Now, here we are, Max. You've uh -huh. arrived at the end of the movie. The emotional core where we find out her heartfelt journey was pointless because the rest of the family got <laughs> gets home at the same time she does. Now, what do you think about like just the way this moment is structured? Obviously the acting is really incredible. I think it is. It's, it's emotional. Catherine O'Hara is really great in this. She, I mean, she carries this entire moment. Yeah. Um, which, as we've said, is super important because you need. She is the one upon which the entire like redemption of this family rests. Right, and you have to buy because yes, the rest of them are already unforgivable. Well, they're they don't even exist, really. Yeah. And if we buy it from her, then we'll buy it from the rest of the family. But I do think it's interesting how she comes home and it's like, you know, the rest of the the house is so like clean and there's kind of like, I don't know, this image of this kid who's become this weird precocious freak, basically. Kevin went from being a creative, mischievous troublemaker to being someone who like is basically, I don't know, like a sociopath in the making. <laughs> He does all the social rituals of like acceptable, like, I don't know, Christmas time shit, you know? And he, he goes shopping and they're like amazed by that. And it's like, I don't know. That's like weirdly depressing. He's like, yeah. he's in for, he's like redeemed such a mundane, pointless existence. It's like you downgraded Kevin. You were a MacGyver living on the edge of being a criminal, stealing toothbrushes. But now you're someone who, uh, went shopping and and like I don't know gets excited about like tax deductibles and fabric softener. <laughs> Nothing. I love how John Hurd refers to his own son as what a funny guy. <laughs> what a weird animal. What a funny guy. <laughs> what a strange creature. He's your son? <laughs> like, what's going on there, John Hurd? I, I, you know what, Max? I'm starting to become convinced that John Hurd has some sort of, like, debilitating head injury. <laughs> where he's kind of, like, stuck in a semi-adolescent state, and he keeps forgetting that the, these are his own kids. Oh, where am I? <laughs> what a funny guy. What a funny guy. I wish I knew him more. You know what I'm realizing, Max? It's just so funny <laughs> to refer to any children as, like, guys. What if I, like, uh, what if I was walking over to you when you arrive here, right, in the garage, and I'm like, oh, can you hold the door for those guys? And it's just, like, kids. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that's that weird. I, I don't know. I think it's funny. The way he delivers the line is very <laughs> <laughs> What a funny guy. <laughs> Macaulay Culkin did it. He saved Christmas. And this old man. But he did not save Buzz's room. Or the tarantula. Or the tarantula. Although the tarantula is still on the loose, right? Yes. Okay, good. But it is allied with Buzz and... <laughs> <laughs> yes. So that's fine. And that's Home Alone, everybody. Yep, that's Home Alone. Macaulay Culkin's best movie where he doesn't get killed by bees. So. A weirdly enigmatic movie. Yes. A movie that simultaneously feels so familiar, and I have this instinct of it being so welcoming and wholesome. And yet you watch it now, it becomes thoroughly this celebration and like repudiation of anything that would challenge this like really 
like repulsive family. <laughs> and I, I'm just completely repulsed by everyone in this family. And I'm left with the impression that Kevin is doomed to become a terrible person. Uh, someone who would be like an overachiever in the worst possible way. In the serial killer field. In the serial killer field, but also more like specifically like Kevin is going to become like a democratic strat strategist who is like talking about Bernie bros. That's what I think of Kevin. I think of someone who's like a real like shit heel. That's what I feel like I see him becoming. And no, that's in, fuller in the, in the vein of American psycho. No, fuller is going to be the Republican strategist. Oh, they're going to have a little split in the family. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, if you want to listen to us, make up bullshit about other characters <laughs> in other movies. You can find more episodes at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or listen to those episodes on Spotify, iTunes, or Stitcher. Now, Max, do you have anything else to say I'm about gonna, Home Alone? I'm going to give the listeners till the count of 10 to get their no good stinking bodies out of our podcast. Oh, no, One. No, no. Keister. No good stinking Keisters Keister. Off of our podcast. Stinking body. What the fuck? Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>